Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Ridgeview Church. My name is Alex Barrett. I'm the lead pastor here. And we are on week three of our series called Sundays. And we've been looking at what we do every week as a church and the importance of it. Uh, it's easy in life as we get in routines, as we do things repeatedly, to just do things without thinking. Uh, do you do that in your life? There's just certain chores or maybe things that you do all the time. And sometimes you just do it without even engaging your brain or maybe engaging your heart. Well, even though we do things every week as a church, uh, these are the things that we should be reflecting on. We shouldn't just be going through the motions. And so this series has been about how do we actually be intentional about the things that we do repeatedly when we come together as a church. And we kicked off the series talking about the importance of singing songs and why do we sing these worship songs to God. And it's really the reminder that our whole life belongs to Him. And we sing these, these songs really as songs of thanksgiving, like we're so thankful for all God has done. Uh, last week, uh, Joel Berry stepped in. Thank you, Joel, for doing that. And he talked about engaging the Word and why do we read the Scriptures together uh, on Sundays as a church. And really, that's the recognition that, that we really need God's guidance. It's easy for us to kind of keep hitting walls and get stuck and detours and get off track. But God's Word is actually given to us to help us. It's a compass. It's a light to our path. And so that's important as well. And then today we're talking about giving. And that is, why do we as a church receive an offering? Now, ever since we've gone online, offering has looked different because you're not getting an offering bucket that's passed like we have normally done. And even at church at the park, uh, we've changed our protocol so things are, are touch-free. But even though we may give online or we may drop things in a bucket instead of it being passed, the offering is really just as important part of the worship service as singing is or reading God's Word. Because again, it reminds us that everything we have been given to and given from God is, is, is from His hand, from His graciousness that, that He's poured uh, onto us. Now, it would be silly of me to think that when we hear giving that everyone just feels great about it. I don't know about you, but there's times when people are asking me or wanting me to donate money that it feels kind of pressure. I don't know about you when you go to check out at a store and they want you to donate to some sort of a fund and you kind of get in that moment where do I round up my change? Do I say yes? Do I say no? And you can kind of feel bad. Maybe you don't want to make eye contact. Well, in church life, it's actually similar things that can make us feel uncomfortable. Maybe you've recognize some of these thoughts. Here's some thoughts that swirl when we kind of talk about the offering. The first is, I can't really afford to give right now. It doesn't fit into my budget. It's simple math. So anytime you talk about giving, there's just part of it. It's like, I just, this doesn't fit into my life. That could be where you are at. And that, that's okay. Another thought is, I don't really want to give anything, but people might notice if I don't, and I don't want anyone, anybody to think I'm cheap. There's a lot of pressure that we can put on ourselves related to giving. This idea of like, are people watching me? Are they thinking I'm a cheapskate if I, I, I don't participate? And those are thoughts that can really cause a lot of problems for us. Another thought is, maybe my little gift won't make much of a difference. Even a whole 10% of my income won't help the mission of the church very much at all. It's easy to just think, how do I make a difference? Why, why would I participate in this? And that's a thought that's normal. And then another one is, why is the church always seems to be asking for money? Now, depending on the kind of church that you grew up in, uh, they may have just talked about money every week. Here at Ridgeview, uh, we want to talk about money in a way that helps people actually understand what the Bible says. And so, on the front end of this message, I don't want you to feel uh, any guilt or pressure. In fact, the scriptures are clear that there's a sense and really the direction of our heart should be that we want to give freely. Uh, there, there's not guilt that's weighing us down or this sense of like we want to please the people uh, watching us. This is something that you can deal with between you and God. And he is going to tell you the next step that you need to take. It's not my job to convince anybody about giving. In fact, God is building Ridgeview Church. We don't need anyone's money except what God is doing in the hearts of all of us. And so if you just feel a little pressure, you feel, uh-oh, where is this going? I just want to relieve some of that tension right now and just ask God to speak to your heart, allow the scriptures to speak to you. Because money and what we do with our finances is actually central to the Christian life. It represents what's important to us, what we spend our money on, what we give to, what we save to, all those things, they represent our priorities. And so what we wanna do in every aspect of our life, we wanna hand that over. And I wanna go back to 
uh, that Romans 12 verse that we started this series on. And here it is, just as a reminder, Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So on Sundays, when we receive the offering, and we have this as a part of our service, whether you're giving online, or whether you're dropping it in the bucket, or whether you're sending it in through a giving envelope, however you choose to give, that's actually a part of worship, just like singing is, and just like reading the scriptures is. It's this sense of like, God, again, this is me just as a living sacrifice giving you back what you have given me. Now, as we talk about money and we talk about our finances, it's so easy for us, again, those thoughts that I mentioned, to get pulled in the wrong direction. Uh, you can feel guilt, you can feel pressure, you can feel just like, why is this area something that God wants to address? But again, just like everything, this represents a lot of our heart. And our hearts can be easily misled. It's easy to get into ungratefulness. I don't know about you, but I can take things for granted. Then I can start to think that I need to control my life and everything in it. And I just want to keep this kind of really tight fist around everything, including my money. Well, what God wants to do when you decide to follow him is he wants you over time to begin to just unleash that finger grasp and that grip, that hold that you have on your life. You still have a will, you still have a brain, you still have a heart, but, but what you begin to do is you, you begin to unleash that grip and allow God to just have this open hand where it's like, God, you, you have my life. And in my life is, is, is everything. And, and I wanna give it all. But there's that pull that we're gonna continue to have every day of our life where we just wanna keep just getting that clinch back. Here's a scripture that reminds me of this. This is Romans 121. This is talking about the human condition. It says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So there's a sense, even for those of us who follow Christ, there's always a sense when we, we can get pulled into blindness. And we can get pulled into our hearts being hardened, thinking that we know best or we know what to do. And oftentimes it's in the area of our money and our finances that God tests us. He kind of pulls at our heart a little bit. He wants to see, are we really willing to give freely? Are we willing to give our time and our resources? Are we willing to give our money? And so, so much of growth happens in this area. And so that's what I want to focus on uh, today. Uh, I want to share a quote that's been a help to me. This is by Francis Schaeffer. It says this, the beginning of man's rebellion against God was and is the lack of a thankful heart. In the beginning, Adam and Eve, they were given everything they needed. They were given this beautiful garden to manage. They were given the provision of food. They were given life. They were given each other as, as companion and as husband and, and wife, but it wasn't enough. They chose to just do the one thing God told them not to, and that was that rebellion. And so it's kind of the sense of they just saw the one thing they didn't have and failed to see everything that they did, everything that God had given them. And I think what Francis Schaeffer is saying here is, is really on point. It's this lack of a thankful heart. And so I want to talk about how in giving and how unclenching our fist and releasing our grip on our resources, how that actually helps grow uh, this thankful heart in us. And so let's ask the question, well, why give? Well, giving an offering actually does a few things, and this is why we do it on Sundays. It's something that we're commanded to do. First, giving an offering reminds us of the one who gave us everything. You'll see a theme here. We sing songs to God because of the mercies he's given us in the life. We read his word because we need his guidance. He's given us direction. And then we give because he's given us everything. It's an expression of worship. It's an expression of our dependence on him. Our spiritual forefathers uh, learned this just like we can learn this. And David, who was one of the most influential and cherished kings of the Old Testament, he was labeled a man after God's own heart. Now, David was not perfect. He was a mixed bag. He actually did some terrible things, but he also did some good things. And that's like us as well. Uh, we have good motives and bad motives. But one thing that he did have was he had success in his life. He had influence. Uh, God really blessed him as he obeyed him. And he was at a point where he had built his kingdom and he looked around and he had mansions that he was living in. And he was like, wow, God, God I, I, I'm really taken care of. You have been so good to me. 
So he did the opposite of what Adam and Eve had done. He was looking around and seeing all that God had done. And he was filled in his heart with just this, this drive and desire. God, you have built my house and my kingdom. I, I want to build you a temple. Because you've been so good to me, I want to, to really reciprocate. I want to give back all that, that you've given to me. And he began to, to kind of plan and pr- you know, prepare and pray to, to build this temple. And uh, through the prophet Nathan, the prophet said, actually, you're not going to be the one uh, to build the temple. It's actually going to be your son, Solomon. Like this idea of like, yes, God has blessed you, but it's going to be your, your son, uh, who will build this temple. But what I love is, is David's heart. Even after that news, he decided that he was going to be in a position, well, if my son is going to be building this temple for God, it's my duty and our people right now in this generation, it's our duty to gather the resources, do all we can to prepare so that when the temple is ready to be built, that they'll have the resources needed. And so it's really this, this point in Scripture, in the book of 1 Chronicles. If you've never read this, it's, it's a fascinating uh, story. And in verse or chapter 29, uh, you see the, the story coming together, and the resources are being gathered, and God's people are saying, you know what, we are going to do all that we can to build and to give back to God. He's been so faithful to us. It's our time. We, we're going to be faithful uh, to Him. And I want to share a, a blessing and a prayer uh, that, that David expresses because it shows the heart of this when we give. It's really this reminder of the one who gave us everything. Check, check out what he says. He says, this is 20, uh, chapter 29, verse 10. It says, therefore, David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. And so there's just this picture of thankfulness. We bless your name. Everything that we see is yours. It's from your hand. And then he goes on. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. That is like you're the ultimate authority. Verse 12, both riches and honor come from you and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Verse 13, and now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. That is just a a beautiful picture of this dependence and gracious heart filled with gratitude. And David just got to the point where before all his people Although he had the most power in the land, he had the most influence before everyone. He says, you know what? This is not about me. This is actually from God's hand. He is the giver of everything good in my life. And Sundays should remind us of that. Now, you may be asking, well, what does giving look like? Well, in the Old Testament, the pattern of of Scripture and what you find in the Bible is this idea of, of giving a tenth, a tithe to God. If you've ever heard the word tithe, uh, it actually literally means a tenth, like a 10%. And so in the Old Testament, and then Jesus uh, affirmed this, and and you need to look for love and and mercy and justice, not just focus on tithe, but, but he also said to not neglect the former. And so you see this pattern of giving in scripture that David's talking about, and this gathering of resources where really this, like the, the level of giving is that this, we're going to give a tenth back to God. Now he He has it all. He's the giver and owner of it all. But in our thankfulness, we're going to give him back this 10%. uh, That's the tithe. And so when we give a tithe to God, when we give uh, this uh, offering to him, it's this reminding, like, honor is is due his name. Praise. And we can do that as we give our money. Again, it's that, like, movement from that clenching of our resources to, um, like, thank you, God, for all that you've given. I, I give you this back. And it's this time of worship, just like David uh, represented. So reminds us, giving reminds us of the one who gave everything. Second, it helps accomplish God's work in the world. Now, David knew that the gathering of resources was not just, okay, let's build a temple and allow God to enjoy it. But it's this idea of let's build a temple and let's continue the movement of God in the next generation. And then the next generation and the next generation. This is building the kingdom of God versus just building my own kingdom. And David had looked around. He said, my kingdom 
Look at all God has given, but let's focus on how do we expand God's name? How do we spread his goodness and his grace to the next generation and to the next generation, to the next generation? So he began to think, how do we continue this movement of following God and making him central to our family, making him central to our, our community, making him central to every aspect of our life? And so when you do that, you get to be a part of his work in the world. You actually can give beyond just your own life. When you're just having your own things and kind of accumulating your own wealth, when, when you die, it could get passed on to your kids. But over time, it can just fade away. We can't take anything with us. But when we give to God in his kingdom, there's a work that gets extended for generations. David continues in chapter 29 of 1 Chronicles, and this is what he says. He asks a question. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and at, of your own we have given you. Again, same perspective. Everything belongs to you. Now, verse 15, he shares some really interesting perspective. For we are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Again, David had incredible influence. He wasn't just like this sojourner that had nothing to show himself, but in the end, he's saying, really, what is our life? It's so brief. Like we're in a position of like, how can I just focus on what I can gather? Because my life is here and then, then it's God. It's just like a breath that's there and it vanishes. And then he goes on. Our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no abiding. Verse 16, O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and all is your own. Again, he's sorting and he's describing this in front of the people to give them perspective. Listen, our life is so short, he's telling them. It, 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 it's just gonna be over so, so briefly. So why would we just focus on our own life and obtaining all that we can when we can give to God and see him multiply and see him multiply? And in fact, make deposits into eternity. Because that's what you do with the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is forever. It will not end. Nothing can stop it. It goes on forever and ever and ever. And when you give to God and his work, and what he wants to accomplish in the church and throughout the churches in the whole world, we're actually giving to eternity something that will not fade, something that will not burn, something that will not degrade or fade with time. And this is David's uh, perspective. Strangers and sojourners, our time is so brief, we need to give to something more. But here's the deal. When we talk about giving, it's so easy uh, to me, spending. So when you talk about giving, it's easy to talk about spending because you've got to have something to actually give. And so what David is just saying, again, is we have to continue to, to test our hearts. And this is what he actually says. Verse 17, it says, I know my God that you test the heart and you have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things. And now I've seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. That's why I started with the heart and those feelings that we sometimes have. Because anytime you talk about your money, we've earned it, right? Like there's a sense of like, I've worked hard for my money. I put in the time. Maybe I've invested it. Maybe I'm just working over 40 hours a week to get this. And there's a sense of like, like now I give it back to God. Like that can be hard. But notice the heart is, there's this freely enjoyed, like for all that God's given. It's this pleasure of giving. God, this is like the least I could do. And, and David continues uh, to go here. And then verse 18, he says, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. What David is now talking about is this lineage of faith. And I really think this is a good word for us because in the church today, we have to continue this same faith that David had, that Abraham had, that was passed on like, God, you, you have been so good to us and you've blessed us. We need to continue to give. And really this is this spirit of generosity. And this is the kind of generosity that we want in Ridgeview Church. We wanna be a group of people that do not withhold from God. We don't wanna be stingy in our faith. We wanna trust God that he will come through. Even when we extend ourselves, even when we sacrifice to give, uh, we wanna be a church that trusts that God will take care of us 
because he's given us all. He's given us the very life that we have to make the money. He's blessed us to be able to earn it. He's blessed us in other ways, even when we don't deserve it. And it's the least that we can do. So giving reminds us of the one who gave us everything. And it also gives us a chance to be a part of God's work in the world, something that will never fade. So let's turn the corner. What happens when we give? Well, first and foremost, we worship God and it expresses our gratitude for what God has given us. So when you give an offering, however you choose to give that, you're worshiping God. It is, like I've said, this actual act of worship. And it's an expression of that reality. Second, all our offerings further God's work here in Ridgeview and beyond. So when you give, not only are you worshiping God, which is what we said, it's reminding of, again, the one who's given us everything, but when you give to Ridgeview Church, it helps us accomplish the mission that God has given us. As you know, any organization needs money to function, and the church is, is no different. But the thing is, God is always working, and He is always providing, and He moves in the hearts of His people to accomplish the work that He has given us uh, to do. I just want to highlight uh, some of the ways that your giving has helped us as a church. And here's some images of some events that we've done. You see our Christmas service outreach that we did this past Christmas to really share uh, about the birth of Christ the Messiah. And it took money to pull off that event, but it was so awesome to see a new people that we got to host and share the good news about Jesus. Uh, we've seen the January Jamboree there that we hosted in January just as a fun event. It cost money to pull that off, but it was a great event to bring people together even despite the wind. You see some of our kids zone events there uh, that really are again us looking at the next generation like how can we teach them and help them and we also have again like Joel mentioned our family kickball event which is coming up this next week. So all of these are, are ways that the money that you give has made a difference. Not to mention all the other expenses that happen like for marketing and outreach. And we're going to be doing a door hangers for Easter. And we're going to be doing these over two weekends and it costs money to print uh, door hangers. And we have flyers that we're going to be passing out to our friends. And then our Easter service, which is going to be April 4th, uh, your money, the offering that you give helps us do this. Whether it's the marketing, uh, you could see a lawn sign there that we're going to have printed that you could put in your lawn that we're going to put by the park so people know. We want to get the word out because we want people to hear about Jesus. And when they hear about Jesus, their lives can change as they turn to follow him. And so all of these ways, whether it's events we've had or events that we're prepping for, these really help us accomplish God's work among us. Uh, there's also other ways that your giving helps us even beyond Ridgeview. Uh, we're a part of a network called the 176 Network. You can see uh, the webpage there, 176network.com. You could learn more, but we're a part of this network of churches and we give uh, every month to this network and we're planting churches across uh, North America. And we're partnering together to offer training programs that we want to help people learn what it means to really follow Jesus. We also give every month to the IMB, the International Mission Board, and this funds missionaries across the world. There are people that are trying to reach people that have never heard the name of Jesus. And your giving helps us give to that organization so that they can learn about Jesus Christ. Your giving is making a difference. Uh, here at Ridgeview, we've increased our staff and we've grown the number of people who are getting paid to help the Ridgeview work get moved forward. And again, that comes from your giving and your generosity. And so I just want to thank you for the ways that, that you have given. And it's so fun to see the work that God wants to do. So all are offering further God's work here in Ridgeview and beyond. I want to go back uh, really to this sense of God's goodness. And it's reading again what, what David said in 1 Chronicles 29, 12. It says, both riches and honor come from you and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might. And in your hand, it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. I've already shared some of the events and some of our plans, and we have money to do this. And so when we talk about all that God is doing 
it just reminds me of this. We thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. So in front of you as, as your pastor, I just want to thank God for all he's done. And so I just want to thank God right now and pray to him. God, thank you so much for all the ways that you have given to us. We praise your name. We give honor to your name. You have been so faithful to us. Thank you for the, the money that you've given to us as individuals and as families. And thank you for all the ways that you provided as a church. And so we thank you, God. Thank you for taking care of us as our Father. In the name of Jesus, amen. I want to share just some other realities that really should fill us with thankfulness. Um, here's just some stats for our church. We, we have a no debt uh, as a church. We, we pay our bills every month. Um, when we first started, we had more outside giving, and our outside giving has decreased over the last two years by 75 to 80%. But our local giving, that is the people of Ridgeview Church who call Ridgeview Church their church home, our giving has increased. So isn't that so fun to see? Our outside giving has decreased but our local giving, the people within Ridgeview, has increased. And what, what we've seen happen is we see God's provision. We've not been without what we've needed to do what we need to do. Our local giving has grown uh, over 25% during 2020, a crazy year. Uh, that's significant. Again, we've added four paid positions for staff and people who help us in various ways over this last year. Uh, our local income has continued to grow as people have continued to step out in faith. And so when we talk about honoring and praising God, it's for these things that we do. Wow, God has been so good to us. So the question is, well, well how can I give? Maybe you're at a place that you've not started giving yet and you're trying, trying to figure out, well, what, what does that mean for me? Well, here's uh, a few ways. Uh, first, uh, we talk about this every week, but the three ways to give, there's a, the slide there. And uh, online, you can set up a one-time or reoccurring gift. For myself, I set up a reoccurring gift uh, just as a, my own worship to God. It's like every month, I'm going to give this amount. And I do that just so it's automated. I don't have to remember. And it's just this sense of like, I don't have to make a decision. It's decided. I'm going to continue to do this. And so you can set that up uh, online. You'll see the, the giving page there. You press on the giving a button and you go to the giving page and you can set that up. It's easy to do, but it's still an act of worship. So even though in ease, it can sometimes be thoughtless, it's still an act of worship. Every time you press a button to submit your money to God, you're worshiping him. Uh, you can also give through our, our giving envelope. You can send that into our PO box that's on there, or you can drop that in the service as you attend a church at the park. But anytime you drop an offering, Anytime you submit a gift, it is worshiping. And when we have these offering buckets on Sundays, they don't look like much, but they represent God's work, right? Because when we give, we are funding the work that God wants to do. And it's an expression of, of gratitude for the mercy that he's given us, the life and everything else. Now, I want to encourage you. If you've never started giving a tithe, uh, that may be the step that God wants you to, to take. Now, it may not be you go from nothing to 10% because there may be just a lot of things that you need to adjust in your budget. There may be just some faith that you, you need to grow in. But I encourage you, uh, pick a percentage because God commands to give a percentage of our income. And in the Bible, again, that's represented a 10% and, and beyond to grow in generosity. But if you're not there, just consider well, what's a percentage that I could start of my, my income? And if you don't give anything, maybe it's you give 1%. Maybe you give 3% or 5%. Or maybe you, you've been following Christ a while, and this is just an area that you've just not been able to get to yet. Well, it might be time. God is gracious, but it might be time to kind of take the training wheels off and say, God, I'm ready to trust you fully. I'm ready to do things your way, and I'm going to commit to giving 10% of my income. In fact, the Bible actually says we can test God in this. So if you never tithe, and you sense this is something you need to do, for the next month, two months, three months, test God and just give that 10% and see how he provides for you. He knows that we just need his help. We need the faith to grow, and, and God will give that. So wherever you are, consider what, what's the way that I can worship God uh, this week? And so consider what's the next step that you can take. And so as I talk about that, here's some specific ways 
that I've already mentioned, but here's some next steps. The first is ask God to reveal any wrong attitudes toward giving. Hopefully you've seen the heart of David as we read in 1 Chronicles. This freely and joyously, but maybe in your own heart, there's just some, oh, you, you struggle. Maybe you just need to ask God, God, will you show me just any wrong attitudes that I have? And, and he will, he'll show you. Just keep asking him that. That might be your first next step. Second, start giving a percentage uh, to Ridgeview or increase it in faith. So if you are giving a percentage, maybe ask God, how, how could you increase it? If you're not yet giving, take a step to give. If you're giving a percentage, again, what's that next level? He wants you to continue to trust him. And in your money is one of the key ways that this happens. And then the last next step is just make giving an act of worship this week. So this week, however you decide to give, that's your sense of what you need to do. Take the time in the middle of that when you're going to give to just thank God, just like I did today. Just thank God for, for his provision. Again, I just am so thankful for all God is doing. And I, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful that you, you've tuned in, that you're engaging with our worship service. And I'm thankful for all of you who give to Ridgeview. It is such a beautiful picture of God's people coming together to accomplish his work. So hope you'll join us next week as we conclude this series on Sundays. We're going to be talking about the importance of volunteering and serving uh, together. One other thing, uh, two weeks, uh, Thursday night before Easter, we're going to have our Lord's Supper. And so you want to save the date for that. It's going to be 6.30 p.m. uh, Thursday before Easter. And that will be a time where we come together as a church to remember the Lord's sacrifice. And so look for more details. We'll email you. Uh, Fill out that connection card. Take your next step and let us know how we can pray for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the help that you give in this area of, of money, which can be just such a struggle. It can be easy in our hearts to just just doubt or be in fear of how you'll provide. It's sometimes easy to be stingy and want to just keep a tight clinch on what you've given us. But God, thank you for the examples in Scripture of the reminder that everything we have belongs to you. And God, thank you for the work that you're doing in our church, the way that you're changing lives, the way that we're able to not only impact our our, our own generation, but but reach the next. So God, we, we do praise your name. And we thank you for who you are and what you do in our church. Continue to grow our giving. Continue to give me wisdom and our leaders wisdom as we look at what's the best way to steward all that you've given us. We pray this in the name of your precious son, Jesus Christ. Amen.